encourage you to go to wc.com and bookmark that page and then visit all the archives. If you download the app, they'll be there as well as my blog post. So today I welcome you and I want to talk with you about a game and I've really struggled with this. I really struggle with it. The game of dodgeball. I remember playing it as a kid and I, and I really liked it as a kid. However, the way we played it as a kid is a little bit different than the official rules, although there are uh, a number of variations to the game. But just to set it up for you, obviously, if, if, if there's a line drawn right through here, there's a team on this side and a team on this side, and there's several balls on either side. And then there is a, a line that's drawn that when they blow the whistle and you go, you run and get the ball, but you can't throw it right there and hit somebody. You've got to back up so far before you can actually throw the ball. I just wanted you to, to get the idea. So there's balls on both sides, and the idea of dodgeball is this. It's a game in which two teams try to throw balls at each other and avoid being hit themselves. I promise I'm going to lay this out and make some sense for you. In the United States, the game is typically played in, you know, grades 6 to 12 and elementary, although it has gained international notoriety as a sport, uh, you know, as well as middle school, high school, and college. It's very popular for informal settings. Uh, it's played on playgrounds. It's played on basketball courts, volleyball courts, and gymnasiums and recreational leagues around the world. There are many variations of the game, but the main objective is this. The main objective is to eliminate... Your opposing team, all of them, the main objective is to, to knock all of them out. If we were to divide the church today, and they'll be bringing the dodgeballs in a moment. Now, I'm only teasing. <laughs> if this side over here had dodgeballs and you had them, and, and every time someone gets hit by a ball, you're out. Provided you're hit on the full. I'll talk about that. Um, so, in other words, you get people out. Uh, offensively by striking them with the ball. Um, now, if someone throws a ball at me uh, and I catch the ball, they are out. Are you with me? However, if I bobble it and it hits the ground, then I'm out. So, um, so you get people out by hitting them or catching a ball that's thrown at you or drawing to throw the ball and forcing someone out of bounds. If they go completely out of bounds, they're out. So, now that, that's pretty good. I, I thought to myself that, uh, you know, the devil sometimes will draw back and, you know, we don't necessarily get hit, but he pushes us right out of bounds with the Lord. So, when a player gets hit by a dodgeball on the full, what that means is it did not, the ball didn't hit the floor, it didn't hit the roof, it didn't hit the wall, but it hit you cleanly. You're out. And you must take your place on the bench. Are you with me? Say amen. All right. So if one or a number of people try to catch a ball and end up dropping it, everyone that touched the ball is out. So think about this now. If the devil tries to get you into some foolishness, huh? and he throws the ball at a group of three of you, and you're all bobbling it, and you all got a touch of the, you know, you all touch the ball, unless somebody secures that ball, all of you are out. Now, I'm going to make some sense. I don't know any ladies' rules out before we preach. On the other hand, if a player catches the ball, if someone is thrown at him or her, that player is out. And the team that caught the ball is allowed to reinstate the person who's been sitting on their bench the longest. So if you throw it at me and I catch it, and Richard's been sitting on the bench for the longest time, I can reinstate him to my team. Are y'all following me? Say Amen. And I promise you we're going to get there for in just a second. Now, the ball has to be held for two seconds to be considered a caught ball. In dodgeball, what's this? Some of the games are played on basketball courts. And I didn't know this. But if a player throws the ball and it goes into the basket or hits the backboard on the full, in other words, it didn't hit an eye beam or anything else, but it rings the basket or hits the backboard, the throwing team's entire bench gets resurrected. I thought it was a pretty spiritual application for us. I mean, they even use the word in the roof, resurrected. I said, hey, I'm not going to build something out of that, right? So uh, anyway, so let me move on. But here's what I want to tell you. At Calvary, 
Jesus Christ was hit on the full. Are you with me? Say amen. He didn't dodge anything. He was hit with all that Satan had to offer. Everything hell had came down on him. He was hit squarely, and Satan screamed, You are out! And so he is taken to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But what Satan didn't realize, the father must have caught the ball. Because in three days, Jesus was reinstated and resurrected. Are you with me? Say amen. The devil didn't realize that Jesus had said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. They said 40 and 6 years this temple was in the building and you will raise it in three days. What he said is, I'm not talking about brick, mud, and mortar. I'm talking about this body right here, this temple. If you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. And he did. The grave could not hold him. Death could not keep him. He died in humility, but he reigns in victory. Amen. Give the Lord praise for that. Now I want you to know something that a player can also use a dodgeball. Say, for instance, you've picked a ball up and you're about to throw it, but here comes an incoming. You can take the dodgeball and, and dodge that incoming ball. Are you with me? And as long as it don't hit you, you're good. It can hit that ball that you're holding. However, if that ball gets shaken loose from your hand, you are out. Hence the saying, we cannot afford to drop the ball. Are you with me? We cannot afford to drop the ball. And I know we think about that in football terms, or at least I do. Uh, now, if a ball is thrown from outside the court, see, players are allowed to leave the court to go get a ball. However, they cannot throw the ball until they are back in bounds. Now, the devil don't care where he's at. He's going to throw. Are you all hearing me? Say amen. But uh, even if you're outside and you can't legally throw the ball yet, if you throw it and I catch it, you're out. Are you all hearing me? Now, um, a player can use, uh, well, well, I shared that with you, he can use that dodgeball, but we cannot afford to drop the ball. Now, he, I, I want to say this, and in fact, I think I'll save it till the end. This morning, I want to draw some parallels, if I may. I want to draw some parallels between dodgeball, the rules of dodgeball, and this Christian life that we're called to live. Are you hearing me say amen? Some parallels, in other words, I want to show you some life lessons, if I may. And, and here's, here's the deal. Are you all ready? It's real simple. I mean, it's so elementary, I'm almost ashamed to tell you that I struggled so long to build it. Sometimes you throw the ball. Are you hearing me? Sometimes your opponent throws the ball. And sometimes God throws the ball. Let me show you. Judges chapter number 6. Do you have it? In Judges chapter number 6, the children of Israel did what in the sight of the Lord? The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so who delivered them? The Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian. That's a country. For how long? Seven years. Let me just tell you right now, we're going to read the rest of this. God has thrown the ball at Israel. Israel has done evil in the sight of the Lord. And now I'm using this parallel of dodgeball. Don't, don't go out and say, well, pastor said God threw a dodgeball at Israel. Please hear me and understand what I'm saying. God has allowed Midian to come against them. The Bible says the hand of Midian did what? Prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made themselves dens, caves, and strongholds which are in the mountains. Um, so it was when Israel had sown. You know why they made those dens and caves and strongholds? They were trying to dodge the Midianite people. Are you hearing me? So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up. So would the Amalekites and the people of the east. They would come against them. They would encamp against them. Watch this. And they would destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. And they would leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. 
uh, they would come with their livestock. Watch this. This is Midian. would come to Israel with their livestock, with their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to do what? To destroy it. For Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel did what? Cried unto the Lord. Let me tell you this. When God throws the ball at you, it won't be long. You'll be crying. When God throws the ball, it will not be long that you'll be crying. So, uh, so Israel was impoverished. Verse, uh, uh, verse 10 says, I, I am the Lord. In verse 10, uh, do not fear the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. He says, but you have not. What did he say? But you have you have not obeyed my voice. That's why God is the thrower. So that's what I want to show you the first time. You cannot dodge the ball when God is throwing. If you have walked away from your covenant with Him, if you've walked away from Christianity, if you've walked away from your faith, let me say this, when God gets ready to draw the ball, when he gets ready to throw, Jonathan Edwards many years ago preached a message about sinners in the hands of an angry God. I'm not sure if I agree completely with the theology because God wants everyone to repent. But what I understand the tenor of his thought. I'm simply saying when God is trying to chasten you, he knows how to get your attention. So God throws the ball sometimes, and God knows how to take you out. Now, the second point I want you to notice is that when the enemy throws the ball, because they often do. When, how many of y'all had the balls thrown at you this week with the enemy? Come on. The rest of y'all are lying. But, uh, yep. So when the enemy throws at us, now here's the problem. Well, he, our problem is this. is oftentimes we want to call on God when the enemy starts throwing the ball and we're not in a right place with God and it takes us a week, you know, to get our heart right with God. It don't take but a minute to get your heart right with God. It don't take but a second, but it takes you a long time to forgive yourself. Preach, preacher. It takes you a while to forgive yourself and feel like you're worthy enough. Let me say this. You ain't never going to do enough to be worthy enough. You're never going to do enough. But when the enemy throws the ball, I want you to understand that as soon as that enemy raises his hand towards you, listen to me. If you're right where you need to be with God, if you're walking in covenant with God, walking circumspectly as you should, God is going to raise up a standard against that enemy. When the rivers come in like a flood, they're not going to overflow you. Are you hearing me? When the fiery darts, when the, arrow, the terror by night or the arrow by day, when it comes, it's not going to get you. Oh, let me show you. Psalm 91. Are you there? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God and Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and the pestilence, or the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings he shall make re you shall make refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. He, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. He says, nor of the pestilence that's walking in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Are you with me? Uh, only with your eyes will you look and see the reward of the wicked because you have made the Lord your uh, refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, in their hands to bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. He says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. God says he loves me. And, and uh, we've set our love on him. Therefore he'll deliver us because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I'll answer him. 
I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Listen. God throws the ball sometimes, and you can't dodge it. But when the enemy, if you're walking where you need to be with God, listen to me. When the enemy throws at you everything he has in hell, I don't care if you just now lost your job. I don't care if you just lost your spouse. I don't care if they just repossessed your car and kicked you out of your house or whatever. If God be for me, who can be against me? Amen. Under His wings I've come to trust. Amen? I rest in His pavilion. The Lord is a strong and mighty tower. The righteous run to Him, and we are safe. Hallelujah. So sometimes the enemy, well, most of the time, the enemy is going to throw the ball. But then there's going to be times where God is going to do like He's doing today, and He's going to challenge you to throw the ball yourself. See, it's real simple. We talk about God throws the ball sometime, the enemy throws the ball sometime, and then you're supposed to throw it sometime. Now, I'll tell you something. In dodgeball, if you don't ever do anything but sit on the stool and do nothing, you're going to get hit and you're going to be out. You've got to be able to shut and jive and move and jump over something, throw it at your feet, duck something, throw it at your head. You've got to be on the move. You've got to be agile. And then not only have you got to be doing that, you've got to, to look for uh, some ball somewhere so you can find somebody that's unaware and peg them to get them out. Now, let me show you this. God was after Gideon. Now, I want you to understand what's happened. Israel done what in the sight of the Lord? Evil. God drew back and hit them with the land of Midian. They came as numerous as the locusts on the grass. I mean, hordes of people came in. They took their women. They took their children. They took all of their crops. They took everything, and they'd done it for how many years? Seven years. They come and took everything. And, and Gideon was hiding uh, in a cave threshing wheat, trying to dodge the enemy Midian. And God says, Gideon... Time for you to throw the ball. Now that's Mike's version. It's time for you to throw the ball. Let me show it to you. I know some of y'all are like, well, he didn't tell him to throw the ball. The Bible says in Genesis 6 and 11, And the angel of the Lord came and sat under a terebinth tree, which was in Oprah. He says, um, Which belonged to Joash the Abizite, uh, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Gideon said, Oh, my Lord. Gideon said, Oh, my Lord. Uh, he says, If the Lord is with us, then why has all of this happened to us? That's what a bunch of y'all are saying. Now, Lord, why? why you? Now, I don't pretend to answer for God, but let me draw this parallel. Maybe he's saying, Because I threw the ball at you. You're down and out today because I've hit you. Now, I wanted to put you out for a while. I wanted you to bring back to the place where you would cry unto me again. Huh? You were riding a big high horse like Nebuchadnezzar. He talked of his splendor. He talked of his glory. And God reduced him to eat grass like an ox. Are you all hearing me? Let me tell you something. You can ride a high horse all you want to, but I'm telling you, God knows how to hit you and take you out. He knows how to hit you where it hurts. He said, Gideon said, oh, my Lord, if you're really with us, why has this happened? The Lord says it happened because I've thrown the ball. It's happened because I have punished you because you have done evil in my sight. And for seven years, the Midianites are coming. And now they've done this to you, but the Lord says, I'm tired of that. Uh, Gideon said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us in the hand of the Midianites. You know what? The Lord hadn't forsaken you. He's standing right by. He's standing right there. Let me tell you something. When you're going through the fire, he's got his eye on you and his hand on the thermostat. Mm-hmm. That's right. And some of you are just like a thermometer. You can tell the temperature, but you can't do nothing about it. It takes a thermostat to do something about it. Uh, I have people all the time, well, Pastor, you need to do this and you need to do that. They can tell, they can read temperature, but they can't do a thing in the world about it. 
Listen, we need to pray till we get to the point where God says, all right, it's time for you to throw the ball. All right, it's time for you to, to, to do something. It's time to get up and get going. And he says to uh, Gideon while he's hiding, he says, you're hiding out. He says, listen, the Midianites come. Yes, because I sent them because of the evil that you did. Now I'm, I, I, I'm satisfied that y'all are praying. I'm satisfied that you've cried. I'm satisfied that you've repented. I'm satisfied that you're, you're trying to get back to God where you ought to be. So Gideon... You're a mighty man of valor. Angel said that to him. He said, look, you got me mixed up with somebody else. I'm the least in my father's house. We're just a poor family in the tribe of Manasseh. We're just hiding to try to get by. And I'm going to tell you something. There's some saints of God right now that, that, that are hiding uh, beneath their privilege. They're in a place right now and God's called them by name. Maybe you've walked away. Maybe you've done some things that you're not proud of and God's not proud of. But it's time to get up and do something for the Lord. You can't do it without getting right first. Hello? But I'm going to tell you, when God throws the ball, when, when you get to that point where you don't know what in the world I'm going to do, and they're crying out, and then the angel says, it's you. God has laid his hand on you. Let, let me finish reading this before I preach the rest of it. He said, did the Lord bring us out of Egypt, but now he's forsaken us, and he's delivered us in the hand of the Midianites? The Lord turned to him and said, go in the might. This is your might. And you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent you? Now, the problem is, is for the last seven years, you've sent Midian. <laughs> you know why he sent Midian? Because Israel couldn't behave. But he says, you know what? I've seen enough. I've heard the cries of my people. What did the Bible say? Y'all remember? Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, which are called by my name, They'll humble themselves and they'll pray. They'll seek my face. They'll turn from their wicked ways. Let me tell you, when God throws the ball, He can get you to the point where either you'll curse Him and die or start praying. So they started praying. So watch this. The Lord turned and said, Go in this your might. He says, uh, um, Have not I sent you? So He said to him, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Some of y'all are doing the same thing. Let me say this. God don't call the equipped he equips those whom he calls. Amen. And this little young lady stood before you, Melinda, right now said, this morning said, I'm not really sure. She sat in my office and said, oh, I don't know, but what about when a parent comes to me and I just, you know, uh, when that ha or if that happens, I said, no, it ain't no if, baby, it's when. Somebody is going to disagree with you. That's part of leadership. Welcome to it. Amen. Somebody is going to disagree. You, you can get over that about if. They are. But, but he says, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will go with you. Surely I'll be with you. Watch it. Here's, you've got to note this. When it's your time to throw the ball, God said, I'll go with you. Amen. You might have, when, when God sent um, uh, 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 an army in to get Israel, you remember when they deported um, Ezekiel? You remember when they deported Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach? And you know what Ezekiel said as we sat by the river Kibar? They hung their harps on the willow trees. But you know what? They was wondering and they were all this. But Ezekiel said there's one thing about it. God didn't send us into exile. God went into exile with us. There's a term, Jehovah Shammah. That means the God who is there. He says, you know what? I'm going to punish you, but I'm even going to go with you while you're being punished. So, so let me try to read this and make some sense for you. He said, um, I'll go with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And then he said to him, now, Lord, if I found favor in your sight, show me a sign that you're going. It's you that talk with me, and do not depart here from me, I pray. Uh, he says, um, you know, show me a sign. Now, I'll tell you something. He showed him a sign. He, he, he made a meal and all that, and the Lord sent fire and consumed it, and, and the angel done some wonderful things. Let me, let me tell you something. Did you know Gideon's daddy served Baal? Did you know that? I don't have time to preach this. I, I, I'm going to say it real quick and move on because I want to get to uh, something else. But that night, Gideon went home, and you know what he did? In the middle of the night, he got up, and he cut down his dad's statue to Baal out in the front yard. He cut it down. The people got together the next morning and said, who in the world has cut this down? Who, who has done this? And, and you know what? Someone said, this is the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash. You know what? You, they came and tried to talk to the daddy. And they, the daddy stood in the door and they said, you know what? This is your son. Send him out. We know that he has done this. And guess what? The Lord had done, done some work on daddy. 
you know what daddy said? He says, uh, tell Baal to avenge himself if he's offended. Are you with me? Say amen. Tell him to fight if he's offended. You know what happened? Gideon had done convinced his family. You know, it kind of reminds me of Joshua. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. I think about Abram when he was called from Ur of the Chaldees. The Lord said, get out from this country and from among thy people. Guess what? His father, Terah, went with him. His father worshipped the moon and the stars and all of that stuff. But let me tell you something. Abraham had a big impact on his daddy. And his daddy came to the Lord. Wow. Now, let me move on. Um, so, here we find the story of Gideon. God has charged. How is he going to do this? What is he going to do? How is he going to pull this off? The Midianites have swarmed a place like locusts. And so, the Lord says to Gideon, and then there were some more things. You know, he laid out a fleece, and he asked the Lord, please let the dew fall on the fleece, but not on the ground. And it happened. He said, Lord, don't be mad with me, but would you show me one more sign? You know, if, if you're about to do something great for God, you really want to know God's with it. And then, he said, Lord, please don't be mad at me, but let, 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 the, let the fleece be dry tonight, and the ground be wet tomorrow. And, and it happened. Just, and so, the Lord confirmed to him, I am with you. Let me tell you this. God will go with you when he calls on you to throw the ball. And God's about to call on somebody to throw the ball. But he says to Gideon, he says, I want you to put out an all call. And I want you to get all of Israel's men that's willing to fight. So he put out the call. They didn't institute a draft. They just, everybody, come on. Let's fight. We're, we're, we're tired of our women being taken, our, our crops being destroyed and pillaged and hauled off to Midian. This is the last year it's going to happen. We want an army. Everybody come. Listen, 32,000 men showed up. 32,000 men. Gideon looked at that thing. I imagine he inspected the ranks and said, wow, 32,000 men. It's quite a number of people. And the Lord said to Gideon, but Gideon, there's too many for me to get the glory out of this. If I throw the ball with all these men, y'all will say you've done it yourself. Somebody will get the big head and say, we took care of Midian. He says, I want you to gather the troops and I want you to tell them. In formation, now I want you to tell them. Everybody who's worried, everybody who's scared, everybody who's afraid, you're free to go. 22,000 men went back home. Are you hearing me? 22,000 men went back home. I imagine Gideon said, Oh, Lord, now you said you was going with me. You said that I would smite them as with one man. I, I, you know, I, I'm willing to throw the ball, God, but you're taking away all my manpower. The Lord said, It's too many for me to receive the glory. He said, Matter of fact, the 10,000 men you got left is still too many. He said, I want you to take them down to the brook. Take them down to the pond, if you will. He said, now watch this. The Lord says, I want to test the men there. I want to test them. And here's the test. He said, when we get down there to the water, every man that, let's just say this is the bank right here and that's the pond. Every man that goes up there like this and drinks like that, tell him to go home. But every man that comes to the bank of the water and does it like this. Every man that does it like that, tell him to stay. They went down there, and guess what? 9,700 men drank like this. With their eyes down, not looking about, but only 300 lapped water from their hand like a dog while their eyes looked about. Are y'all with me? And the Lord said, With these 300 men that lapped water like a dog while their eyes peered around, I will deliver my people Israel. Amen? 32,000 was too many. So 22,000 had to go home. 10,000 was too many. So 9,700 had to go home. I imagine Gideon is shaking in his shoes. Oh, Lord, what are we going to do? And God, let, here it is, mycology. We're going to throw the ball tonight. And with 300 men with a trumpet in one hand and a pitcher, a lamp in another, they come. I, I got to show you all this. Let me show you this and we're going to pray. 
you, you, you got to see this. Um, if I can find it. Here it is. Thank you, Lord. Judges 7 and 13. Gideon was wondering, is the Lord really with me? He's got his 300 men. They're on the edge of the encampment about to attack. How many of y'all know, as Melinda talked about this morning, that God gives confirmation? Has God ever given you confirmation? I want you to see this with me. Gideon is sitting here, shaking in his boots. He's got his 300 guys right here. They got their trumpet ready. They got their lamps in this hand. And, and, and they're about ready to go do what God, they're fitting to lay it all on the table. They're, either, they're going and say, we're going all out. Either God's with us or we die. Oh, for some men and women that would say, I'm going. And but God, if God's with me, I'm okay. And if God's not, you see, but here they are. And the Bible says that they got close to the encampment. Watch this. And when Gideon had come, he heard a man telling a dream to his companion. These are the Midianites. And he said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came into the tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. Watch this. And the companion answered and said, now Gideon's listening. This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, into his hand. God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. So it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he, watch this, right outside the camp before the victory, he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise now, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into my hands. I don't know about y'all, but I feel the good Holy Ghost. He's standing right outside the camp. But God has already told him on at least three occasions, I am with you. And now he's listening with an earshot and he hears an officer say, this is nothing but the sword of the Lord, the sword of Gideon. God has delivered us into Israel's hands. He went back and said, muster the troops, men. We're about to throw the ball. We're about to go do this thing tonight. Hey, hey. and guess what? The next, I mean, they came through. At the sound, uh, when Gideon gave the command, they blew the trumpets and they broke the pitchers and the flames showed up. And let me tell you what they did. They literally decimated the Midian army. And never again did Midian come to Israel. You know why? Somebody was willing. Watch this. I, I want to put it in context before we pray. God had thrown the ball at Israel because they were evil. There's a big contrast with America right there, right now, but I don't have time to preach that. God had thrown the ball. Midian came. Midian came and done all these things, and I told you how our enemies are constantly throwing at us. But God says to Gideon, it's time for you to stand up and do something. And here's what I think. Because I know that many of you are here today, and you've been dodging the bullet. I mean, every day you come home and say, oh, my wife didn't find out about that. That bill I created, she didn't find out today, thank God. Somebody else is saying, well, the boss didn't find out about that money I took. Somebody else is saying, I sure hope nobody finds out about that affair. I sure hope nobody finds out that I've cheated on my taxes. And you feel like I've dodged a bullet one more time today. I'm going to tell you something, the devil's always going to throw stuff at you. It's constant, my friend. In this world, there is affliction and there is tribulation. But I'm telling you, God is on our side. And in the midst of all of that, when you're having to duck and dodge and jump and all of that, and that's part of life, God says, there's some things that I want you to do. I want you to reach down and pick the ball up. You can't sit here and be defensive all the time. You've got to do something. You've got to do something. And I believe God wants you to do something today. Would you stand with me? I told you I would get back to this in a moment. There's an alternate rule in dodgeball. And uh, it's called a no lines rule or open court rule. 
the rule is used at a point when the game has so few players left that it's too easy to dodge the ball from a distance. And so when this rule goes into effect, there's no lines, there's no boundaries. When you pick up the ball, you can run just as close as you want then. And I want to tell you, for the devil, there's never been any boundaries. He never played fair. Amen. He always lied. He always cheated. He'll throw from anywhere. But I want to tell you something, friend. It's time for you and I not to just dodge the balls that are coming at us, the fiery darts of the enemy. But it's time for us to reach down and say, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. And let me tell you this. The, the, the person usually is the very ones that are saying, there ain't no way, God. Moses, oh, God. There ain't no way I can be a leader. I can't even talk good. I'm tongue-tied and uh, I don't speak well. I'm not eloquent. The Lord says, but your brother Aaron can talk pretty good. You can tell him and he'll tell the people. Gideon, oh, no, Lord. I'm the least in my father's house, smallest in the clans of Manasseh. And the Lord says, yep, I want you. I want you. Unlikely people. David, youngest son of Jesse. Unlikely one. Last one to be looked at. God says that's him or rather the prophet Samuel said that's him the rest of y'all stand up till he gets here when he walked through the door he took a hen of oil and poured it on his head the Bible said the spirit of God left King Saul and rested on King David it was five more years before he'd actually be coronated king of Hebron but the Bible says God made up his mind that day here's the man after my own heart <laughs> it's about the eyes are closed I want to 